and we move forward in life. Whether we like it or not, really, right? We move forward in life, whether we really like it or not, it's just kind of like, go do this. Uh, and so we are going to continue to pray for you in the days and weeks and months ahead as you press forward. And so this morning, we're going to continue a sermon series um, that I started last week called The Last Days. And um, if you missed it, uh, that's okay. I would encourage you to go back and listen to uh, part one of, of the sermon. We got all kind of channels going on now through this whole pandemic thing. We got, you know, you go to YouTube, Facebook, you can go to our Elmont Vineyard Church website. And you can find the sermon uh, or sermons everywhere there. And so you can uh, listen to part one if you missed out. I would highly encourage it because uh, one sermon is going to build off of the next. So it's a continuation from each sermon week to week. And we'll be building off of one another. And our primary text is going to continue to be Matthew 24, Matthew 25. Uh, the Olivet Discourse and the Discourse of the Lord talking about the last days, the last times, and what things will happen. And uh, when the Holy Spirit led me to start this series, I had no idea that things were going to get much worse so quickly. Right? Um, things are literally changing by the hour. I was going to say by the day, but by the hour. Uh, just turned on the news last night for a brief bit and found out there was another horrific, tragic death of another, uh, I think his name was uh, Mr. Brooks of Atlanta, Georgia. And it breaks our hearts. It breaks our hearts. Um, things are literally changing by the day, changing by the hour. I've never seen so much hatred, discord, violence in cities all across America. I personally have never seen such thing for, in such longevity of, of time. Inhumane, inhumane uh, bar, uh, I just lost the word. Yes, I'll get it back here. Inhum inhumane, barbaric acts of humanity. Just, just tragic things that we're seeing. And I'm not just talking about the tragic death of Mr. Floyd and Mr. Brooks. That's awful. But I'm talking about just people uh, just running around the streets and just the awful videos that I've seen. Um, people looting and punching and beating. And it just it saddens my heart. It really does. It saddens my heart. It literally breaks my heart watching Americans acting like a bunch of uh, hyenas attacking their prey. Um, taking over city blocks, city halls, destroying statues and historical, mo historical monuments, looting and setting fires to people that own businesses. Hard-working Americans that own businesses that have done nothing wrong, they've contributed to, contributed to society, and they've watched things go up in flames, things are being set on, set on fire, and we scratch our head, and, and, and bitterness can grow inside of us, if we allow it, friends. Bitterness and anger can grow inside of us, and we, be, we, we can become enraged with anger and start pointing our fingers at everyone. But sometimes we need to point our finger at ourselves and say, come Lord Jesus, help me to be the peace that these people need. Help me to shed the light of Jesus Christ where there is no hope. Friends, we as Christians are the hope and the light of the world, right? But it's hard. So much chaos. And so I appeal to God's word this morning which tells us this. 
What do we do? What do we make of such chaos? What sort of context can we put to this? In 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 5, in verses 14 through 17, I want to draw your attention there. I appeal to God's word. It says this, but mark this. Verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Said almost 2,000 years ago. There will be terrible times in the last days. It goes on to say people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. Verse 4, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And having a form of godliness but denying its power. Do we see that today? But Timothy has and encouraging words in the book of Timothy to Christians. But he says in verse 14, now listen Christians, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures. This is the Word of God in which we turn to. He goes on to say, which is able to make you wise. The Word of God makes us wise. It's the wisdom of the Lord passed down to us. Christians, For salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, which is a right way of living. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. May the name of the Lord be praised this morning. Let's pray as we move this sermon forward. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us. Many of us are weak and weary and burdened down, Lord. But you say to come to you when we are weak and weary and you will give us rest. And in you, Lord, we will find peace. And so we turn to your word this morning, Lord, which gives us training in all righteousness. So open up our hearts to receive the good news of the gospel of our Lord this morning. And let your name, Lord, be glorified in the heavens. In Jesus' name, amen. We started off last week talking about the two biggest questions of Christianity, and these are the same questions that the disciples asked, and they went something like this. When will the end of the world happen? There's this dialogue between Jesus and his disciples, and uh, you'll find that in Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14, we covered last week, and we're going to move forward this week. And they said, when will the end of the world happen? Because Jesus said, hey, you see the great temple? He said, all of this stuff is going to be 
thrown down. And they said, Lord, well, when is the world going to happen? It's the same questions we all have, right? When is the end going to come? And then they went a step further and asked the second question that we're all asking as well. When will Jesus Christ return? But the biblical reality is that no one knows. No one knows, right? The day or the hour of Christ's return, it says in Matthew 24, 36, only the Father in heaven knows. But just because we don't know doesn't mean it's not going to happen, right? Just because we don't know doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Praise God, the word of God says these things to us. I'm coming back to take you to be with me where I am. The word of the Lord says he is coming in the clouds. The word of the Lord says I am coming soon. The Lord says I'm coming quickly. I will come like a thief. I will come at a time you don't expect it. Be ready. Be aware. Be prepared. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Lord, and you're welcome to come even right now. Right? Even right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your precious promises. These are the precious promises of God. He is coming back. And he's coming back soon. And yes, we are living in the last days. Things are increasing. And so Jesus responds in Matthew 24 and in Matthew 25. He res responds to two of the biggest questions of Christianity. And he shares some key prophetic insights with us. And this is basically just a, a recap from last week from Matthew 24 verses 1 through 4. Jesus said these things. Number one thing that he said to his disciples, watch out that no one deceives you. Right? Watch out that no one deceives you. Jesus says false messiahs, false Christ will appear. And he even says, and will deceive many. Right? And you know that in the last 150 years, false messiahs and earthquakes and famines and all these things, if you study history, has increased twofold in the last 150 years that's just a you know that's just a, a statistic that's the truth in the word of god he says wars and nations will rise up against each other we've seen that in the course of history we continue to see threats and rumors of war even uh this morning i woke up and just get a got a news flash that now uh north korea is threatening south korea and so we expect these things. Jesus says you're, look, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nations will rise against nation. Earthquakes and famines will occur all over the place. Christianity will be offensive. And I said last week that conservative views will be offensive. I'm pro-life. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not going to apologize about it. I'm a lover of Jesus, and Jesus is the author of life, not death. And so Jesus says that Christianity will uh, be offensive to some, and persecution will take place, and persecution took place uh, towards the disciples. Persecution takes place towards us, and the persecution of the church has been happening since Christ ascended into heaven. Millions have died for the cause of Christ and for standing on his word. And Jesus says, the love of others uh, most will grow cold. The love of others. The most hearts, it, 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 there's going to be a, a darkening in the heart. And I think that we see that today. The love of others that is growing very cold. 
And Jesus says, don't be alarmed, church. He says, don't be alarmed. In fact, he says, understand this, that these things must happen. Right? These things must happen. They have to take place. As much as it hurts, the chaos, the turmoil, the confusion, the violence, the Lord says, hey, look, I mean, he told us this two thousand years ago that you are going to see times like this and it's hard to understand and grasp and wrap our minds around it because it, we're literally seeing some of these things right before our eyes it's difficult but jesus says don't be alarmed because no matter what your soul listen to me your soul is secure in jesus no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. That's a precious promise of the Lord. No one. You are His. So make no mistake about it. These definitely are some heavy and difficult stuff to wrap our minds around. What we are seeing and even what Jesus has said to us must happen. It's, it's heavy. It's difficult to see, to watch, to experience. But you want to know the truth? I'm here to tell you that the Bible doesn't say things are going to get better. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not saying that we're not going to overcome things, we're not going to get through things, we're not going to see better days than we're experiencing right now. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, biblically, the Bible doesn't say the things are going to get better. In fact, it says that there's going to be things are going to get worse and there's going to be trouble and there's going to be tribulation. Right? Great tribulation and trouble. We will see things we never thought we would imagine seeing. And honestly, this last week, I saw things in America when seven blocks in Seattle was overtaken seven blocks in seattle in the united states of america seven blocks people took over i never thought i would see that in the united states of america is my heart troubled absolutely but i'm not alarmed i'm not alarmed because jesus says these things must must happen and friends i'm afraid that the things that we're seeing are going to continue to increase. But Jesus tells us this, when you start seeing these signs, because he calls these things signs, when you start seeing these signs, Jesus says, understand, these are the beginnings, in Matthew 24, 8, of birth pains. And any mother that has given birth knows that uh, birth pains increased more and more uh, before their baby was born, right? Birth pains increase more and more. You will have one contraction, and then that one contraction, it'll turn to two or three or two or three in a row. And then, you know, you'll be saying, we need to go to the hospital because I'm going to have a baby, right? Jesus calls these things birth pains he says when you start noticing these things it's just like a mother that is about to give birth take notice and so we should expect to see more and more signs uh, that we're going to see as we await the savior's return more and more signs it's just just like a michigan spring I just want to remind you, it's 42 degrees this morning. Uh, typical Michigan spring. And by the way, we still are in spring. Summer doesn't spring out till June the 20th. I had to be reminded of that. But it's just like seeing a spring in Michigan. Little buds on trees, right? Uh, the lilac bushes start to come up and the tulip starts to break the ground and they come forth. When we see these things happening in the spring, we know that summer is right around the corner. 
And so scripturally, Jesus is saying to us in this discourse, when you start to see these signs, when you start to experience these birth pains, wherever you're at, take notice and be aware, my coming is soon. And so what we are experiencing right now, the hatred, the violence, uh, a pandemic and political turmoil are all signs of the last days. And friends, we need to get our souls in order. We need to get our souls in order. If, we, if you have not invited Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior, it's, ex, it's as simple as acknowledging Him, acknowledging your sins and saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. We need an awakening in America. We need to return to the Lord and return to His Holy Word. And yes, the promise is He will still heal our land. So the Word of God says, it's time to get our souls in order. And so let's ease into the biblical text today. Turn with me to Matthew 24. We're going to look at verses uh, 12 through 20. It's going to be a little bit heavy. I've read a lot into this this week, a lot of studying, uh, rehashing some things that I've studied years ago, and it's quite eye-opening. You might want it, some may call it a little bit alarming, but these things must happen. These are Jesus' words. I'm going to back up just a little bit into verse 12 of Matthew 24, and we'll take it down to verse 20, and then we'll kind of... Uh, dive into some things that I want to bring about in the text today. Remember, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. It's known as the Olivet Discourse, and he's ministering to them. And so he says this. Let's back up to verse 12. He says this, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end, what's it say? Will be saved. And it says this. This is such good news to my ears. And this gospel, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, of the kingdom, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to the nations and, and Jesus says, and then the end will come. In other words, it will not happen until every ear gets to hear about the good news and salvation of Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God for our missionaries. Praise God for the calling of missional work all across the whole world. We pray for our missionaries, Lord, that they would be bold and courageous from, for you, Lord, and let their light shine, the gospel of Christ. And so the Lord goes on in verse 15. We're going to carry it down to verse 20. He says this, So when you see standing, standing, now I just want you to uh, look at that word, you may want to underline, we're going to dig into this deeper this morning. When you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Jesus is saying, hey, pay attention, understand these things. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, understand what I am about to tell you. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of his house. In other words, 
we're, it's a time of an attack here, and you're not going to want to go back. You're going to want to run for shelter. Take cover, the Lord's saying here. Understand these things. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take things out of his house. Verse 18 says, let no one uh, go into the field and go back to get his cloak. Verse 19 says how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. So this is some heavy stuff. And we talked last week, I just want to bring this back out, that um, biblical prophecy, these are uh, prophecies of Christ, has a dualistic meaning, right? It meant something then, and it will also mean something for the future as well. And so when you read prophecy in the Bible, whether you're reading Ezekiel or Daniel or the words, the prophetic words of Christ here, he's not only talking about things in the present day, which will take place soon, but also in the future. A dualistic meaning. And I want to look at a statement here that has many questions and thoughts and theological opinions about, but I believe it deserves our attention this morning. Jesus' Jesus's exact words are, so in verse, uh, verse 15... He says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, be warned, right? Pay attention. Jesus says, understand. So what's the Lord talking about here? Theologian Lockyer says this about the abomination of desolation. I quote, the abomination is an event foretold by the prophet Daniel and Jesus, a despicable misuse of the temple of the Lord during a time of great trouble. The phrase is found in Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14, as is also quoted in Daniel 9, 27, 11, 31, and 12, 11. In Daniel, the words mean the abomination that makes desolate. In other words, Daniel prophesied that the temple that the temple would be used for an abominable purpose at some time in the future. And as a result, God's faithful people would no longer be able to worship there. End quote. So we cannot ignore Daniel's prophecy about the abomination of desolation. In fact, Jesus refers to it. He says it was spoken through the prophet Daniel, and he takes us back. And so seven times in Daniel, the word desolation is spoken of. And here are four primary uses of the word desolation in Daniel. Desolations mentioned in Daniel's prophecies. Number one, a rebellion that causes desolation to God's temple. And you see the verse quotation there, 813. Number two, a prayer. Daniel was saying a prayer in this particular portion of Scripture, 9, chapter 9, verses 17 to the end there. A prayer for the desolate sanctuary during the Jewish exile, during the Bab Babylonian captivity, and a future hope of rebuilding that temple. Number three, the use of desolation in, in Daniel, the desolation of the Holy Land. So not just the desolation of Jerusalem, but the desolation of the Holy Land. Number four, the destruction, desolation, of the temple that shall come and the Jewish sacrifices as well will be desolate, will not take place any longer. And so I want to quote from the prophecy of Daniel 
in Daniel 11.31. It says this, armed forces will rise up to desecrate uh, the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Now let me give you three primary explanations or interpretations of the abomination of desolation as mentioned by Daniel and Jesus. And these are largely theological opinions. I probably uh, name them in order from the most popular to the least popular. And if we could pull those up. So the abomination of death, here's thoughts, here's, the, here's three primary thoughts, the most popular thoughts per se, of what this abomination that causes desolation that Jesus talked to us about. They, some theologians say that it occurred in 168 B.C. when Emperor Epiphanes sacrificed a pig to Zeus, who is the sky goddess, he sacrificed it on the temple altar and made Judaism outlawed. Some people think that it was fulfilled, that the, the abomination of desolation took place in uh, 168 B.C. when this took place. I would argue that. Because if it took place in 168 B.C., then why did Jesus say, watch out for the abomination of desolation that's going to take place, Right? He, he said, as spoken through the prophet Daniel, if Jesus would have uh, thought that that had taken place, he would have said it had already taken place in 168 B.C., right? So I kind of throw that out personally. Now, you can hang your head on that if you want. Number two, some theologians and people believe that it occurred, a uh, historical fact here, that in 70 A.D., when the Roman army, the Roman army came in and destroyed the temple and great persecution of Drew, Jews and Christians took place. Just a historical fact. All of these are historical facts. And then some will say, number three, that it's not been fulfilled yet, that it's yet to come. Uh, uh, it will take place when the Antichrist comes and sets up his image of himself to be worshipped uh, in the temple. And here's some uh, scriptures that they reference. And so I want to offer you a fourth potential interpretation that I personally believe. You don't have to believe this. I'm just putting this out there. I've studied this. I think this is very very important. This one point right here, the abomination that causes desolation, when you see it standing, Jesus says, be warned, take notice. Listen to this, taken from multiple historical references, it's called the siege of Jerusalem that took place. The siege of Jerusalem. Just a little bit of a history lesson this morning, folks. Listen to this, I quote, The siege of Jerusalem took place between 636 and 638 A.D. Muslim armies invaded, invaded the Byzantine Empire and slowly but surely wiped out Romans, Christians, and Jews from Israel and gained dominance and control. They began to take over holy sites, including the uh, sacred temple mount of the Jews, and in 691, the Dome of the Rock stood atop the Temple Mount of God, right where Solomon had built his temple. And here is a picture of the Dome of the Rock and the Holy Wailing Wall. This is just a historical fact. You can look it up. You can decide for yourself. It's just a historical fact that the Jerusalem siege took place and literally... Millions of people died at the hands of Muslims that invaded the Romans, the Christians, and all who were living in the land. 
And so when Jesus says here, hey, look, when you see the abomination that causes death, and I'm going to put it back in context, when you see this take place, run to the hills, hide, don't go back to your home. Well, when the Jerusalem siege occurred, let me tell you something, what happened? When they start invading and killing takes place, when a war breaks out, they're heading to the hills. They're getting out of Dodge. They're saying, I'm not going back in. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, when you see this take place, you're going to want to run for the hills. You're going to want to take cover. And surely, way back there, in six, uh, between 636 and 638, they would have ran for the hills and even defended themselves. And so here we see the Dome of the Rock. And here's another depiction of it, another picture of it. And so here's some quick facts about the location of the Dome of the Rock. Fact, Muslim armies destroyed God's temple. The dome is standing on top of the Temple Mount to be seen by all. Number three, the Jews no longer sacrifice in God's temple and are praying for a day that they may rebuild the temple. And they go there. Day after day, week after week, and they put their parchments of paper in the wailing wall, praying for a time that the Lord would have them restore the temple of the Most High God. That's their hope. That's their dream. In fact, i dug done a little research this week, and, and it said that the Jews already have the means and the money and the dozers and everything, if they said that they could rebuild the temple, it would be done quickly, just like that. Because that's their, they're already prepared. They already have the, the plans in place, the architecture. They're ready to roll. It's just a fact. The dome is located on the exact spot that God commanded Solomon to build his temple. Just telling you factual stuff. And the last thing I want to bring out, somewhere inside the Dome of the Rock is the original Holy of Holies. You remember that? Where the priests would enter once a year to have an atonement sacrifice for the whole nation. Now, let me make something clear. I'm not talking hate speech here, friends. I'm just bringing you some biblical perspective the way I see it. I'm not calling for uh, war or civil unrest or we need to do something about this. I'm not saying any of this. I'm just bringing some biblical facts as I see it. You have to choose which you think is best. And so somewhere inside the dome is the original Holy of Holies located there. And the Jews are forbidden to enter it. But they stand at the wailing wall. They stand at the wailing wall. And they pray for the presence of God to return. They pray for Israel. They pray that one day that they could, just like Nehemiah, go build the walls again. And they could worship in their temple. And so they pray. And so I think historically in research, that what we have here could possibly be the abomination that causes desolation. Now you, as I said, need to make your own determination. Look into these things. I put lots of things out there. You can read in your study Bibles, or if you need some extra biblical references, I can uh, lend them to you. But I believe personally that this fulfills Jesus' prophetic words. And friends... We need to be aware of the signs of the last days, right? That's the bottom line, is that we need to be aware of these things. And even if you disagree with uh, my interpretation there, I'm fine with that. But we still need to be aware about the signs of the times. So we'll have that in common, even if we may disagree about that. We need to recognize the birth pains the Lord is showing us, and listen to this, and get our homes and our souls ready. As for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. 
We need to wake up, America. We need to get our homes in order and our souls in order and pray to the living God. Jesus says this, look, I am coming soon. Jesus says, my reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what he has done. Praise the Lord for his precious blood that forgives us of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And as we close the sermon this morning, I said each and every week as we have as we dive into this discourse, we will end with Jesus' words found in John 16, 33, which Jesus says to us, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart or have courage, Jesus says to us, I have overcome the world to the glory of God. And that's the end. I know it was a little deep. I know it was a little bit heavy. I know there's a little history in there, but we got to preach the word of God. And, and, and to be honest with you, we got to talk about some things that are, there's a little tension in the room about the last days. There's lots of theological points, and I'm not, I'm not stomping on anyone's position or whatever. I'm just bringing some things out front so that we can study and understand these things must happen. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the saints. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for those that are on Facebook, our Facebook family that have joined with us, that are listening in this morning. May you bless us and touch us. May you anoint our minds and our beings, Lord. You said, Lord, in this world we will have trouble, but Lord, in this world you give us peace. You're a peace giver, so let the peace of God that transcends all understanding come upon our hearts and minds this day. And may we go in peace and have the favor of the Most High. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you. Have a fantastic day, and I will see you next Sunday, if not before. Amen.